Hello, everyone, and welcome to episode 238 of Dial the Gate, the Stargate Oral History Project, and season four of my show. Thank you so much for joining me. Uh, it's a real privilege to have managed to have gotten it this far. I would not have thought it was possible, and I could not have done it without the help of Jenny Steven, Clio Consulting and Industry Marketing Veteran, and Darren Sumner of GateWorld, my partner going back 20 years now. Jeez, guys, how are you? Doing great. Yeah. Happy, happy April. Happy April. Happy spring. Darren, how you doing? I'm fantastic. I'm just bringing up our chat so that I can see what people are saying. Gate World is going to be um, 25 years old this year, isn't it? Gate World turns 25 in October. <laughs> and boy. <laughs> I don't know if I can make it right now. I need some encouragement <laughs> from you guys. Wow! <laughs> you that drag you across the finish line. It was going to be the longest haul. Uh, but, uh, yeah. Hey, I'm, darkest before the dawn, dude. Darkest before the dawn. Yeah, That's I'm, I'm ready to celebrate. I'm ready to celebrate. Yep. I just need some good news. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. Congratulations, David, on season four. Thank yeah. you very much. Uh, I apologize to everyone for taking so long to get back, but it was just... You know, a matter of, of schedules, I had to seriously take some time off to recharge. Because uh, hammering yeah. like three or four of these out a week takes a lot out of you. And Well, and um, season three was like it was, almost it was super extended. Yeah. How yeah. many shows did you do for season three alone? At least 90. So, oh, yeah, my it was, God. It was 85, 90. Yeah. So, yeah. So season four will not have that many. Um, it's just as simple as that. And yeah. uh, I, I'm taking more time off this this year, uh, family and everything else. So some things Good. are coming to a head, but all is well. So Jenny, how are you? How's how's life? Uh, life is great. Uh, I just signed on for a full time gig with a sci fi fantasy author to help her develop her IP across all media. So oh. as a lot of you guys know that know me. One of my favorite things to do is to be able to be right there at the very beginning. And she's written four books already, but I get to be there into the growth of her transmedia and her franchise. So we were at WonderCon. I saw actually quite a few Stargate fans, friends of ours, friends of the show. And uh, we had a big booth and it was kind of our coming out party. So it was really, really <laughs> cool. Hence the purple hair. Because it's... <laughs> It's it's all purple, but I'll give you guys some links at the end to go check it out because I'd really love Stargate fans to go check her out. So you can reveal the name of the of the. Oh gosh, yeah, yeah, yeah. It's okay. called The Last Luminian, and it's the Seven Galaxies franchise Ooh. by S.G. Blaze. And I'll just I'll give you some stuff at the end to go check out. It's amazing. So. Oh, all right, Darren, update us. What's going on with you? Oh, it's been a. It's I'm in kind of a tailspin right now. I've been resetting. Uh, I've been doing lots of online teaching, which requires me to oh. kind of the same thing that I do with Stargate, right? It's it's making content to teach online. It's making video content. Yeah, you're uh, not but, used to that at all. No, my current class ended up being canceled, which oh, I, no. I was perfectly happy with. It, it, it frees me up so I'm no longer, you know, about to feel the tidal wave crash over yeah. my Yeah with the amount of material that I had to create. So now I'm in the pivot spot where I'm turning back to Stargate, back to Gate World, figuring out what we can do for uh, write written content on the website, as well as mm -hmm. some new video content for the channel. Um, but it's good. I'm excited about it. Okay. Okay, great. That's Since great. We last spoke. Were all of us here for the, um, the Stargate and the Hollywood Strikes episode? Was it both of you guys? Yeah, and it's been a while. I think so. Yeah. When did we last do a State of the Gate? A state of the was Gate was like 16 months ago. September-ish? So, or no, that was last. No, it was it was December of 22. I went back and checked. I thought we did something at least. Oh, like we did the Hollywood strikes. Yeah, I don't I don't know that I was on that one, was I? Uh, Star Wars Future amid Hollywood strikes. You were absolutely oh, on that. Oh, that's right. That's right. July that's 15th right. We were, of last year. We talk about the strikes. So it's that's why right. talking about the state of the industry as a summer. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. It's um 
it's the my understanding is that it's contracting particularly like the the new television show development has gone from 600 shows to 300 shows this season mm -hmm. is that correct yeah so that's across a couple of not just broadcast linear television so it's also streaming ott and the contraction was expected honestly by most industry yeah. uh analysts but in terms of some of the people that were internally they didn't expect the layoffs that happened so and we can talk a little bit more about that about what happened between fall of last year and january february of this year oh my god i heard him yeah come on yeah. Keenan. say that. hello he's Bring him in. he's lots of talking lots and lots of talking Keenan. there's david Where's Hi, David? I, I know. Where's I'm David? See you this Where's... summer. <laughs> he wants to go see you. I miss right, that little I boy so to, much. I may have to uh, close him out. But <laughs> there was, there were the contraction of the shows themselves was the end result of the contraction post COVID mm -hmm. and the strike. Even if the strike hadn't happened. Yeah. This contraction was going to happen in some manner, shape, or form, because the you'd think that they would have understood how this works. But prior to COVID, and we've talked about this a lot, prior to COVID, they were not sure how well streaming was going to do. So those like NBC Universal, Comcast, Amazon, uh, all of them that had Disney set up their streaming channels were not actually convinced it was going to work and they had it had not committed to full slates on each of these streaming services they had no uh, bets netflix and amazon were the only ones at the time that had actually committed to original series slates for longer than the first two years everybody has five-year plans but nobody had committed in 2018 2019 to full slates COVID happens and all of a sudden, they all thought, oh my God, it's the Holy Grail. Yeah. It's Shangri-La. We yeah. found the Fountain of Youth. This is going to be great. And we all know, yeah. And we all know what happened is that, unfortunately, they didn't plan for post-COVID where people go back to work. People go back to their lives where everything is not dependent on binging or dependent on watching. And it took a full two years. But the 22-23 season is when you started to see the layoffs. And 2023 was bleeding employees. Yeah. And it was because they had bloated, unfortunately. Now, the worst part about this is that the entertainment industry has a tendency, as we've talked about before on the show, to overcompensate in its pendulum swing. And once again, they overcompensated where they laid off an enormous amount of employees. Amazon, and we're going to get to that in a little while, in particular, had three different rounds of layoffs that were specific to the studio and MGM was affected in this last run. So what ends up happening is that you go from development execs who are out there actively looking for new projects or development to maybe one or two, and they're wearing 17 different hats for each silo of type or theme. And that's what's happened. And then the strike happens on top of everything else and they lose six months of development and production time, depending upon where they were in that sliding scale. So from April of last year through December of last year, there was a weird mix of, okay, we can do pre-production meetings, but we can't write anything. Okay, now that the writers are over, we can write something, but we can't meet with actors, so we can't get contracts. And talent agents wouldn't, for right, rightfully so, meet with anybody. So you had development execs who were desperately trying to say, we support the strike, but we got to make business. And you ended up with a nine month retraction or cancellation of a slew of streaming shows, movies, everything. And as we also saw with Warner Brothers, with Acme, with a particular show that I was working on with NBC Universal, these were all in the can and they got pulled and yep. canceled. So all of this is an adjustment. If there's anything that I can say, having been through many of these cycles, mm -hmm. this is not unheard of. This is not abnormal. This is pretty consistent. 
the problem I think that they're facing is that there's a lot of fear management going on right now. And well, it has the benefit of happening of view, at a at a time of a uh, major, you know, financial problem where where you know, so many people can't even buy houses. You know, so that's right. and, and so many of these folks have lost their homes. So there's right. a lot of there's a lot of of things. Stuck what are you going to spend wheel? on luxury items? Yeah. Right. That's and entertainment is luxury. Entertainment is the last in and the last out of a recession or an impacted economy. The Hollywood Reporter and Variety two weeks ago, week and a half ago, had a big splash. I think it was the Hollywood Reporter. Uh, entertainment industry is entering a depression. It's, you know, it's all over, folks. Like, this was the most ridiculous article I've I've read. But what they were doing was they were saying, look, we're looking at four factors in an equation that usually lead to the entertainment industry being in a depression. We're always the last into a depression. We're always the last out. Recession, depression, impacted economy. In this case, I think that was an overreaction, but I understand because what they're looking at is, David, to your point, an economy that's impacted right now. There's radically <laughs> insane inflated payments and people who can't afford gas. So you have an economy, you've got post-COVID, you've got post-strike, which is the third variable. And the fourth variable is too many places for people to find their entertainment. So there is no focus. The bubble was always going to come back down the other side. Exactly. Said, they went into this with a five-year plan. I don't remember when everything launched. The one that sticks in my head is Apple TV Plus launched in November 2018. And that's yep. because of the Jason show. It launched with C. Yep. So yep. we were reporting on it at the time. Uh, so as you say, the five-year plan, COVID or no COVID, there's going right. to be another end to that that arc. And That's right. To a degree, this was always going to be the case. But Jenny, let me yeah. make a little analogy for folks, and and then you correct me and tell me if you think this is this sure is or not. We look back, especially Stargate fans, right? Stargate was in its heyday, 2008, 2009. Right. Lots going on in the global economy. But in the entertainment industry, of course, the big shift that we saw when the SG-1 movies were coming out was the collapse of DVD and physical yeah. media sales. Yep. That was another kind of sky is falling moment for the industry. <laughs> yes, so I want to I want to suggest that this moment that we're experiencing now with this this contraction in the entertainment industry due to uh largely I think due to streamers. Yeah. It, like and unlike what happened with the home home video sales. Mm. I keep saying home video cuz I'm an 80s kid. What do they actually call it? <laughs> It's not videos. Uh, well, they call media. it uh, digital media, DVD. Yeah. They still do. They call it home entertainment. Oh. Yeah, I mean, at Disney, physical, that's what it's called. Physical sales of DVDs and Blu-rays is what I'm, I'm talking about. So with streaming, it's the same sort of thing in the sense that the entertainment industry seems to be having a major freak out because uh, the people are going away and the dollars are going away right. from what was for several years a real cash cow. But it's unlike that because it's not like the audience is now moving on to the next thing. Right. They're just right tightening their belts. They're deciding which ones to pay for. They're deciding, um, right. I'm not willing to pay for ads now that they've added ads to this service I was watching. Right. So I'm just going to drop it. They're and, working 60 right. hours a week to watch. Yeah. So yeah. do you think? What do you think of my analogy to the the? DVD? I think it's spot on. Yeah. Yeah, I think it's spot on, and I think it's the same cycle that we see if. And, you know, remember, that was also the housing collapse. So what you have from 20, 2008 to 2012 is a massive economic issue in the United States that then was a domino effect globally. And when we had the housing collapse and the DVDs were switch shifting, quote unquote, to digital, all of that happens when it happens at the same time. It is a complete sky is falling. And what's always fascinating to me, and I know I've said this before, it is not that the sky is falling for independent content creators, for independent creators. Because for us, it's an opportunity to do something that fills a gap, fills a need, that the, the studios, and this the irony here is not lost on me that I am old enough that the people that used to be the startup rebellious people are now the man, which is Google, Facebook, YouTube, everybody. Um, 
it gives an, an independent creator an opportunity or an independent production company an opportunity to fill that gap. And probably the best example of that is Jordan Peele with Monkey Paw yeah. Productions. And there's a lot. There's a lot of really good examples out there, but he's the one that most people would recognize as here's someone who very slowly in the background started building his business and started doing it the way he wanted to while also getting money and doing the projects that he needed to do and then started just reinvesting that money into his company and reinvesting that money. He did one project a year. Actually, he did one project over three years, which was Get Out. Then the next, then he had two. Now he's not only got his own, but he's buying like Dev Patel's Monkey Man. And mm -hmm. these are things that successful independent creators look around and go, hmm, okay, you guys aren't doing it right. You think the sky is falling. I'm going to go over here and go after these fans and I'm going to do it this way. So to bring it to Stargate, Stargate falls, unfortunately, right in the middle of that. Mm -hmm. You have independent production companies who have bid on this, who want to do it, who have bid at Amazon. They're the right people to do this. But you have the behemoth that is no longer the rebel, but is the man, literally, making the decisions about whether or not it can go forward. So where do, where do fans follow in all of that? Where do we go? How do we support it? Right? That's the next question. I'm hanging on, you know, for I, Darren and I have been doing this since what 2000. When did uh, Universe go off the air? 2011. Um, 11. Yeah. So at, at this point, it's just a question of of when. And Stargate is one of those where it's it's not tall enough like Star Wars or Star Trek, but it's not you know short enough that it gets completely. Right that it disappears, you know, it's, it's always kicking around right. in news stories. People are still talking about it. You know, when MGM was acquired by Amazon, you know, well, this is going to be something at some point, but right. they think that just the frustrating thing is once the uh, contraction was realized, it was like, as far as I was concerned and Darren, maybe you could speak to this a little bit. It was like, well, Stargate's probably not going to be, one of the ones that are going to percolate. It's not It's not buoyant enough to percolate to the top dealing with this. We're going to have to get through this phase of whatever this is and then revisit the situation later on. You mean, current, you mean currently right now? Oh, I would disagree. You don't think but so? I wanna... You think that no, Stargate but... could come out, just a new announcement could be made right now? I do, actually. But Darren, I want to hear what you think first, because you've been talking more yeah. to the licensees and the mm -hmm. people who actually are dealing with Amazon. Yeah, and the, the, the silver lining is that MGM's licensing for Stargate is on the upswing. We've had several new licensees come on in the last uh, couple of years. But to the, the question, David, you make a, a great point, which is... I mean, the last five years, the, the sort of streaming boom, there was a ton of content mm. spending and it felt like, okay, Stargate's been off the air for going on 10 years when that boom was at its peak. If not now, then when? Right. Now that the boom is over, it it, it is discouraging to say the least because it seems like MGM and Amazon missed their window for a variety of circumstances for, uh, you know, the acquisition and and the whole FTC battle and oh, COVID gosh, yeah. and the strikes. There were reasons, but mm -hmm. um, I'm I'm not not optimistic. How about that? I'm not not <laughs> optimistic. <laughs> I like I like not not so optimistic. Perhaps possibly cautiously optimistic. Oh, Is that fair to say? I'm at a. I mean, I talked to you guys a little bit behind the scenes. I'm at a. I'll believe it when I see it kind right. of a, a, a standpoint right now, because as you say, we've been doing this so long. We've been on MGM watch since 2011 when right. it went off the air and there was a movie and then there was no movie uh, with Emmerich and Devlin. And then there was origins and the hope of more origins. And then that went away and then the sale came up. Yeah. So yeah. it's been a long road and I'm an old man at this point. <laughs> I came to a really strange realization recently, which is that right thinking about GateWorld's big anniversary coming up, uh, GateWorld has been more of GateWorld's life has been without Stargate <gasps> than we've ever had with Stargate. Oh, yeah. 
Isn't that a weird idea? Whoa, it's that's weird. May, May was when SGU went off the air. Right. Of May, it's been 13 years. Oh, that my can't God. Be right, is it? Okay. Yeah, because there were 17 I'm seasons. Close yeah. the door so we don't hear <laughs> okay. the dog going back. You know what? <laughs> Jeez. It's the extra entertainment we all need. I know, oh, right? I love that dog. I'll go from the room. All right. I'm back. Uh, <laughs> that was a that was a really weird realization for me was that yeah. we've been covering Stargate longer since it's been off the air than we ever covered right? it was on the air. So I mean, then you think about like, okay, Star Trek went off the air, and then came back with JJ's movies, and that what was that gap? That was five years. Yeah. Plus they announced it while it was at the start of production, right? A couple of years earlier, <laughs> and, and probably and, three years. And I loved the uh, movie. Paramount plus April Fool's Day, where they're skipping Star Trek Four, they're just going to Star Trek Five. That, that was post. funny. That was. Yeah, I mean, that, that was, was good. really good. Yeah. Okay, so I'm going to be the the Pollyanna. So here's <laughs> here's where I'm at. There's a couple of reasons why I think that this is not dead in the water, or if not, if you're not saying dead in the water, uh, that we didn't miss our window of opportunity. There's a couple of reasons. There are constant cycling through of executives at MGM and Amazon, at any studio. And every time a new executive comes in, they look at the catalog. Yeah. Every time. Yeah. I'm glad we're talking about this. And every time that happens, and I've been part of it at different studios, you'll think, oh, my God, we're never going to do Predators again. Oh, my God, we're never going to do Aliens again. Oh my God, we're never going to be able to pull Firefly out of the ashes. So I've been part of many of these reboots or revivals, whatever we want to call it. And I'm going to show a, um, if, can I share a screen, David? Yeah, be my guest. Okay. So in a second, I'll do that because that's, it was a really pertinent article that just came out um, in the past week or two. And every time these execs come in and they look at the catalog, they want to be the one to put their imprint on it. They don't want to inherit. It's like a sports team, right? They don't want to inherit all the managers and coaches from before. They want to put their own imprint. So part of the problem with Stargate, and this is heartrending for a lot of us, is that there's been this should we or shouldn't we with Brad. Mm. And that's that's tough, right? And it's do you want to use that person? Do we don't? We, he's obviously talented. He obviously has an amazing creative writing group. He obviously has had successes after Stargate. But do we want to do that or do we want to make our own imprint? So you've got that. Then you've got the fact that just in January and February, the last of the MGM uh, layoffs have happened. And everybody that said, oh, my gosh, I can't believe that happened. I can't. No, that was a pretty normal merger and acquisition time frame. It takes usually about two weeks for the redundancies and or the decisions to be made for the people that are on the acquired side to either be completely absorbed two or years. laid off. Two years. Yeah, two years. Now, there were a couple that I was extremely surprised at because it seemed – counterproductive to lose some of the people that we had worked with, for instance, that were laid off. But that's done now, which means you have Jennifer Salky, Nick Pepper, the whole group saying, okay, now we started with some of the easiest, the non-scripted reality series. Those were easy to renew. Yeah. We've obviously pursuing Bond because duh. we're in talks with Sylvester Stallone. Because, again, duh. But, and they ran a couple like Creed, some that were already in pre-production before the strike happened. Then they get to the point and they go, okay, we had our own slate, Reacher, Rings of Power, mm -hmm. etc. Mm -hmm. And now we want to really get serious about MGM. And that conversation actually started in first quarter of last year. Okay. When the strike happened, it all had to be put on hold. All they could do was continue with what was already in the can. Thank God for them, Reacher was already in the can. Post-production could continue. They weren't on strike. So there was a lot of delay when there had been quite a bit of talk from my sources first quarter last year. Okay, now we're going to sit down. Now we're going to decide what we want to do with Stargate. So, okay, cool. 
now we're past the strike, we're past first quarter, which nothing gets decided in first quarter for this kind of thing. So, okay, now we're in April. And my feeling is that there's an opening here that will be open for quite a while. And it'll depend on a number of factors. As we all know, lots and lots and lots of shows go to pilot, go to development, and nothing ever happens with them. But this is an existing canon that very easily can get picked up. And I think regardless of what it gets picked up as, a movie, a series, whatever it is, there's no question there can be an opportunity here. And I think that we have an opportunity that's almost brand new because we're past the strike. We're past the what was already in the canon. And here, um, this is what I'm going to share. So this was a article, I can't remember. Uh, David, I shared it with you. I can't remember yes. whose article it was. But basically what it was talking about is reboots and remakes of scripted shows. And primarily this is in streaming. So this is from Parrot Analytics. And a friend of mine works over at Parrot. And I asked him the background on this. He said, look, we were shocked at Parrot. And the reason this came up is because they had done a couple. Oh, my God. He's going to drive me nuts. It's okay. Can you hear him? Just a little, but he's okay. So they, Parrot was surprised at this percentage. And he said, streaming and pilot. So you look at 2019, it's before COVID. Mm. It actually, COVID right here, 2020 to 2021, obviously, that's where we had the biggest boost. But we're back up to, two, to 2020 numbers here in 2023. Mm. And here's the kicker. Netflix has the biggest. Guess who has the second biggest? It's Amazon. 5% of all of their scripted shows are going to be are going to be reboots or remakes. So that doesn't mean adaptations like Reacher. And mm. that means we have a chance because this is something they're dedicated to, which is catalog. They uh-huh. bought MGM for their catalog. They are not going to ignore a juggernaut that they've got right there ready to go. And I think that This more than anything, this is an article that just came out where they're talking about Amazon's catalog in the article. And this is just two weeks ago. So I think I think I'm beyond cautiously optimistic. My cynicism only comes from the standard entertainment industry. You just don't know. These people could get fired tomorrow that are all excited about Stargate or (laughs) my question. Yeah, you know, I don't know what's going to happen there. Marsha well, Middleton, it's... if I may insert Darren before you yeah. jump in. Oh, yeah. Marsha Middleton wanted to know, do you think the 30th anniversary of the movie will have any effect on Stargate content? No, I don't. Okay. Because it's owned by Lionsgate in joint ownership with MGM. Um, but but if, if again, that depends. If Jen Salky says, hey, or, okay, let's, I'm sorry, let me back up. For, for what I've heard, and I haven't heard anything recently, but as of December, which was the last time I talked to anybody, Michael Wright still wants Stargate on MGM+. And my understanding in December was that that was the direction the conversations were going in. But again, you know, I'm almost four months out of the loop there. But that is my understanding. So if Michael thinks that running the movie on the 30th as a kickoff from a marketing standpoint, sure. But I don't know that it's never had any impact on their decisions before internally because it's kind of messy. But but I don't know how Amazon, honestly, I don't know how Amazon legally treated the rights of the movie. Interesting. Okay. I apologize, Darren. You were saying? No, it's, it's, uh, it's, about the the revolving door of executives. This is part of what we've been watching as mm-hmm. quarterbacks for when when Stargate, what fate Stargate, uh, <laughs> is the revolving door of executives, both at MGM and Amazon, the folks yeah. who call the shots. Uh, every once in a while, Jenny, you'll forward us a, a deadline article about yeah. the latest person who's left or <laughs> the latest hire. Right. And, um, trying to keep track of who's who's going to be in the room. We've talked about this right. on State of the Gate in the past. Who's in the room making yeah. the decisions about MGM's catalog? 
Uh, and it, 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 what I've been convinced of more than anything is that obviously Stargate has to have an advocate in the room or it's not going to happen. Oh, yeah. We've, right, Jenny, you've told us about folks in the room over the last 10 years who evidently... It's the only reason it happens. Stargate from having yeah. kind of stood in the way who are no yeah. longer there. So I look at folks today, right? I look at folks like Michael Wright and the success that that he's having uh, attempting to build MGM Plus mm -hmm. as a as a venue for MGM's content, right? Now that's not the the only place that MGM's wow. content goes. MGM still sells its shows out, licenses its shows. Yeah. Some are wow. going to go on Prime Video, you know, Vikings had its deal for wow. years with Yeah. What Hulu and Netflix? Yeah. Well, Hulu like, for sure. Yeah, I now can't they remember. Got, they got uh, Wednesday on Netflix, yeah, which is another yeah. MGM show, right? That's a, a pre-acquisition show. So I'm watching uh, what's Michael Wright doing on MGM Plus because mm -hmm. he's like the, the sort of person who could be our advocate in the room, right? And if there's not an advocate for Stargate in the room, it's just not going to happen. I agree, and it's you bring up a good point too that. Well, two things. Let me back up a little bit. If we're going to have an advocate, Michael Wright is a good one. So I believe in him. I believe in everything that he's done. I also just personally know that he loves Stargate. Whether he wins that argument, I don't know. But like I said, as of December, the plan, plan, and again, remember, first quarter last year, there were plans to have the discussions, and then the strike happened. So in December, the conversations were, I shouldn't say play on the conversations, were that Michael Wright would take it on MGM+. Plus. What that looks like, what it means, who's going to work on it, you know, I don't know. I mean, my understanding in December was that Hawk Osby and those guys had moved on. So I don't know who would do it, who would direct it, who would develop, who would write it. I don't know any of that. And I have no information right now. But I do know that the advocate that's going to most make the difference would be Michael Wright. Outside of that, Ironically, I know everybody's got, you know, their complaints about Jen Salfi. She has continually brought up at production and develop meetings, Stargate. And so has okay. Nick Pepper. Now, I don't know how much Nick Pepper is involved anymore with it, because if it does go to MGM Plus, that would be Michael Wright. Nick Pepper is in charge of global, was in charge of global television. I think the other thing that's important is the... There's another article that came out last week about Amazon's international plays that are going on. So for Amazon International and globally, what they're looking at, does this catalog title have legs globally? So right. that's an incredibly huge part of their decision-making process. One of the things that Amazon does is, of course, they buy from other countries their content, as you've seen. Netflix has done it probably better and best than anybody. And Amazon's trying to follow that. And in doing so, they've sent over their head of tele not television catalog, I think, uh, to go to all of the major countries around the world that have a high level of streaming television through the Amazon contracts. Hold one second. Okay. And... Talk I knew to, he was win. <laughs> yeah, I can't, I just, cause I can't handle it. Um, <laughs> and have a conversation with each of those uh, UK, Germany, Japan, South Korea offices mm -hmm. that are the Amazon offices about what are they seeing? Where's their audience? And is there an audience for these titles that they're bringing with them? And one of those discussions was about Stargate. So he's bringing with him the catalog of titles in all of these different meetings that he's having saying, okay, show me what you've got, show me what you guys are developing and here's what we've got in catalog. Do any of these find an audience for you? Yeah. Now, I don't know what the result was because this article was just talking about the meetings that he was doing over the space of six months. But that's hugely encouraging because that means that they're bringing, at least in mentioning Stargate. And then the last thing, Darren, to your point is that you know, during COVID, nobody was going to, quote unquote, syndicate their shows outside of their own streaming channels. And of course, what happened is they all realized that you cannot sustain a business model on just your own and you have to syndicate yeah. it out. 
And even Amazon's going to be looking at doing that with their own. I don't think they're going to do it with Reacher, but my understanding is they're going to be doing it with a couple of others where they're going to be looking to go ahead and quote unquote syndicate it on Hulu, et cetera. So I think that there's three different areas there that give an opportunity that didn't exist a year ago prior to the strikes. Yeah, I, you know, shows like Star Trek The Next Generation wouldn't have existed without syndication. I mean, you have to have, right. I, I, I'm, I was really surprised when they pulled back and were like, no, we're going to keep everything siloed that's ours under, you know, behind our front door. There's so much of a money making opportunity there. And right. all, all you're doing is sharing the content with, with, with more potential eyeballs. So you right. got to keep that door open, in my opinion. You it's know? just crazy. It was crazy. It was a crazy. I, I get it because they can't they thought that yeah. they had found, you know, like I said, the fountain of youth or whatever Shangri La. But I, I mean, honestly, it's it is. Twenty twenty. There was is a business model. It was, and it was a business. There's today. a business. There's a syndication business model for or a licensing business model for a reason. And, and you know, Darren, you were talking about that MGM's seen an uptick in its licensing. That's also something that's fascinating to me is that the licensing and merchandising has not seen an economic impact from the roller coaster. Uh, they've seen slight dips. I had a chart, but I couldn't find it. Uh, taking Disney out of the equation because they're just, they're always going to be the 600 pound gorilla in the room. Mm. You can't really compare it. But if you look at uh, across the board, the different licensing and merchandising franchises that are big yep. there really hasn't been a drop in any of them except for small little ticks that's it so when they're looking at it that is a huge part of their cross-functional decision making in their business model stargate i'm pretty sure from what i understood again from conversations in december the reason they kept those going is because it's a great way for them to test the audience test the pond what's out there, who's willing to buy. And that's what a lot of licensing and merchandising of old franchises is for now. Is they bring it forward, you'll see something, you'll think, well, why did that come out? Mm. It's because they're testing to see if there's an audience there. Okay, that makes a lot good. of sense. Which yeah. is then good news again, right? Because we've got more licenses that they're doing for Stargate. So it means they're testing. And they're thinking about the big picture of the franchise, right? They're not just thinking about what the next show is, they're thinking about what's the, the yes. shape Stargate business in two, three, five years. Are well, because no, I'm, none of them can do anything other than do the full. You can't just a, a franchise cannot just be one media anymore. It just can't. It can't sustain it. Well, George Lucas taught us that. <laughs> so, yeah. The other chief the, toy the maker. Other thing that I'm watching <laughs> is uh, all the the MGM catalog franchises, all those IP mm -hmm. that Amazon mm -hmm. picked up two years ago now. Uh, I, you know, I watch the trades daily. I'm looking for development announcements. Mm -hmm. And one thing that is helping me to hold out my candle of hope for, for Stargate, right? We were told Stargate was going to be a, a priority. It was yeah. a, right, yeah. total quotation marks there. It seemed that Stargate was going to be a franchise priority uh, once they got the ball rolling. I'm watching for other other projects to get announced, right? A right. robot project, a legally bond blonde project right uh and correct me if i'm wrong so far i haven't seen any i mean bond is legally be blondes today. legally blonde is in pre-production that oh, I it do is know. okay yeah it was in pre-production before the strike okay. but when, when i'm talking pre-production i'm just talking they, you know reese exactly. witherspoon's company hello sunshine was in talks with mgm and amazon but my understanding is that those talks have picked back up i'd have to go back and look to check to make sure but that that was my understanding. Yeah, but other, I've seen virtually nothing other than that on um, existing MGM IP getting a new TV series or movie greenlit publicly in development. Uh, and that that tells me, right, that it's not like Stargate's just being left on Correct. the app, but that Amazon as a whole has not quite gotten around to no, that's exactly MGM's right. IP yet. No, that's exactly right. Now, and, and again, everybody has to remember, to us, the strike ending feels like it was ages ago, right? It's almost six months ago now. But in entertainment speak, you think 
even though we don't exist in seasons anymore, you still think in seasons for TV. Okay. And so for development, when they're talking about, okay, that means I have to look at what was in pre-production, what was in production, what was in post. And the priorities are always going to be what was in the can, what was in post-production, those come first. Then after that, what was in production, do we think it's worth it still? How much do we have to pay? And this is what people forget to get all those actors back who have other commitments now. Yeah. So a lot of actors had commitments in 24, 25 production that got pushed out. So it is like the worst possible production board jigsaw puzzle you've ever seen in your life for each of these studios and production companies and streamers and broadcasts to look at and say, what am I going to prioritize? And then way at the very, very back of the line is pre-production. And then farther back from that is development. So if you're looking at Stargate was being in talks for development, just this summer is probably when it would come back up based on all of the norms of what a cycle takes post a strike or any kind of delay, like what we went through. And we're not dealing with post COVID delays anymore. But what we are dealing with is, David, what you said right at the top of the show, the economic contraction. So between the delays that happened because of the strikes that you then have to deal with 24, 25 production that was already committed. And then you have to look at, well, we've just lost half of our development team. And so priorities become much slimmer and you go from 600 to 300 shows. So the beauty of Stargate being catalog is it wasn't a pilot. It's not a brand new show. It's not something that they have to say or convince, hey, this is why this is a great idea. That more than anything else is going to, I think, serve it well because they can come forward and say, there are a lot of people that love Stargate and know it that can write about it. And we can bring those people forward. We don't have to start from scratch. I don't know if they will. I don't, and I'm not just talking about Brad. I'm just talking about current execs that are our age who watched it. So therefore, Darren, going back to yours, the advocate in the room. And that's Michael Wright. Okay. How, um, Yuki at home asked, how many people are usually involved in, in making these decisions? Or is there typically a big <laughs> guy at the top? How much, what percentage <laughs> of control would Michael Wright have? Or is he one uh, equal voice among many at the table compared to Jen Salky and you know, others? So it's different at each, at every single studio okay. production company distributor, it's different. And okay. David, you and I were in many of those meetings oh, that were, I, you know, I, you'd walk I, out going, what the hell just happened? So it's just, um, it's but so I could be specific. <laughs> it's so ridiculous, but I can be very clear as far as MGM Amazon is concerned. So what I didn't realize until I had talked to my source in December is that Amazon and I, we talked about this in July, but Amazon and MGM were very clear who owned what in the merger, in the acquisition. I thought that catalog was going to stay with MGM. It did not. Mm -hmm. So all catalog decisions went to Amazon Studios. Now, Amazon Studios is now Amazon MGM Studios or something like that. So all catalog franchise decisions are with the Amazon Studios group. The last of the MGM uh, mergers of people and resources happened in January. So some of those MGM people are now over there. But for instance, Steve Stark still has his production shingle, but he will have nothing to do with it. Okay. So the decision making to answer more directly is with Amazon Studios. In this case, if it's decided by Jen Salka and um, Mike and Nick Pepper that it's going to go to MGM Plus and it's a distribution, Michael Wright has quite a bit of say. Now, he sits at the table regardless for creative development. So he always has a say in, I'd like this to be on MGM Plus. But you probably have, I would say, Amazon, while it has streamlined, still has a good 10 to 12 people involved in decision-making of development, but it really comes down to Jen, no, to her boss, Mike, Jen, Nick Pepper, and probably one or two others of going from development into pre-production. So I would say there's three or four at the top 
that say, we think this is worth it for Amazon from a business model standpoint. And then there are many people underneath that that have to make the decision, where does it go? What do we spend? Is it worth it? And that would be another 10 people of which Michael Wright, if it goes to MGM Plus, would be a major decision maker. And then you have to bring in a production company. Yeah. Right. Unless they decide to have it be an original, which I don't know that they would. Okay. All right. My efforts to read the tea leaves and to watch what Amazon <laughs> is doing with the IP has been obscured a little bit by what you mentioned, which is that in, in the course of the merger, uh, Amazon has rebranded its studios, right? As yeah. Amazon MGM Studios. So now they right. make announcements. Like I'm looking at a couple of here. Uh, they just announced a, a show development deal with Audible. Yep. Uh, MGM Plus is also greenlit an adaptation of Earth Abides, which is a sci-fi. Mm -hmm. um, this one is from MGM Plus Studios, which I understand is a different entity. But it as is. announcements come out, right, here's a new sci-fi show from Amazon MGM Studios. Is there any way to tell anymore? Or is, is it even relevant to ask, well, is this an MGM production or is this an Amazon production? Or are they? I think it's relevant to us. Organization? Well, it's relevant to us in the sense that the Earth Abides, I wasn't going to bring it up, but the Earth Abides announcement worried me, honestly, because really? it's an, hmm. well, it's a sci-fi by MGM, MGM Plus Studios, which is what Michael Wright has now been put in okay. charge of. And if that's being developed, then where does Stargate fall? Now, yeah. it could be the Stargates get developed by someone else and it's just distributed on MGM Plus, which is fine. Um, but those are the things where I... I look at it and I go, okay, if I'm Jen Salka and I look at that and that's the money we're spending for that this year, do we spend for another one that's going to go on MGM plus? And of course they've got the new rings of power season coming out. So it's not, and again, it's not just about production. It's about post-production. How many resources do you have? The production company that you bring on, can they provide for those resources? And then just as important marketing. So okay, we're going to go, where's our audience for Stargate? And this is one thing that I love. Amazon does do consumer insights very well, very well. And that's in the creative studio side. Um, one of my best friends that David and I have worked for, Bettina Sherrick, she works for consumer insights at Amazon. And she doesn't have anything to do with the, the Stargate decisions or anything like that. But She's been telling me about, you know, what they do and the, their research department. It's amazing what they do. They really do look for where is our audience? Who can we go after? So I will say that to bring it back to the fans, there is no question in my mind from what my friends that work on the consumer insight side say that when we're out there being active and vocal, mm -hmm. I don't know how many years I've been saying this, but don't get tired because right. the minute you get tired, then they'll come to the conclusion that there's no audience. And it's exhausting for us as fans. It is exhausting to feel, like you said, Darren, to say, let's do it again. But they were very clear with me that, that Amazon, and, and again, I'm looking at it from not just the fan, but the marketing side, they do phenomenal. I mean, I wish I had access to their research because it's amazing the insights that they get from their audiences where they are, what they're watching. And they pay a lot of attention to the context. It's not just about the numbers. They have people who give context to the data. I don't know if people understand how unusual that is at a studio or a streamer. A lot of times the data analysis, David and I have been in meetings where they come in and they show the numbers and you're thinking, okay, sure, but what's the context? Right. What questions did you ask? I don't, you know, so what that you've got 30% female females doing what, are you what? Do with it? Are, yeah and and prof who are they professionally what do they watch besides that that's what amazon does phenomenally well and so if they're saying we're paying attention then we should be paying attention and making sure that they hear us i just I sound like a broken record after 20 years but well you know i always have hope because i remember sitting in 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 boardrooms with you you know uh across from i think it was chris whoever i can't remember the conversation that we had but um and then they were like okay here's a stack of um sticky notes go to town every right. i want to see everything and right. it and we spent 
I, I forgot how many hours just plotting Days, out every yeah. single plot point that the franchise had in order yeah. for us to <laughs> visually so illustrate <laughs> these are the ideas that exist now. And I don't right. think we even got to, I mean, we got to most of them, but we didn't get to all of them. So no, there is yeah. always room to take a look at the catalog inside of Stargate itself and mine something That's out of right. it. But I really, right. you know, wouldn't at this stage, I, I, th I think it's more likely than ever, in my opinion, that they'd want to go with something fresh. Oh, yeah. I, I mean, I... It uh, I mean, obviously, because I work with a companion too. I've yeah. talked to Brad. I, I, I think that ship has sailed, and and he does, you know, he's fine with it. My God, yeah. he's successful, and he's got a, so many irons in the fire. I think for fans, it's harder. Yeah. And I, I'm hoping that because there's been enough time that if we stay within the canon universe, which again, I have no idea, but if we did, I think fans could forgive a lot, mm -hmm. and. If it doesn't go with Brad, I think we all need to look at this, especially because there's been so much time, more like a Star Trek re reboot, right? Mm -hmm. That Gene Roddenberry was always the producer on that. But quite frankly, he was certainly not. He was a figurehead. The estate. He was a figurehead. He was not writing. He was not directing. He wasn't even producing by the time Generations came out. So I think what you want to look at is if it stays at least in a Venn diagram, somewhat overlapped into canon, I think that fans would get into it for sure. Yeah. And we'd be bummed that Brad wasn't a part of it, but I think, at least I hope, we're at the part point where it's been enough time where we would say, okay, we get it. We get why it can't happen with him. It's, you know, that's just, you know, Darren, when you talked about the window of opportunity, that's where the window of opportunity, I think, closed, is that that's when... That's the part that really has moved on is to work with Brad and Joe and Rob and all those guys. And yeah. that's sad, but I think post COVID, I think all of us are kind of like, well, well, no, I know there's a huge, there's a huge percentage that still want it, but I think most of us, if it stays within Canon could say, at least it's an homage to Brad's universe to stay within Canon. Yeah. But and, yeah. Fidelity to the universe. I yeah. think of when, right when oh, I love that way from star trek what was the first non-gene show that we got it was deep space nine yeah what a phenomenal show that was it uh, had a phenomenal so showrunner in ira stephen bear exactly. yeah that's, that's right the that's key. right who is captaining the ship who are they so choosing look at ron moore and david like with battlestar galactica you know right bsg was so a all huge ip and yeah it comes yeah. down to the creator because i mean oh man bsg 2004 it has more fans than the original did. So, oh, for sure. sure. And I'm one of the old school original Battlestar Galactica fans and I grew up on it. So, yeah. and I loved the latter better. So, different time, different There's type room for of all creator. of it. So, yep, if, if the right creator comes in and fans get a look at it and go, Ooh, well, I want to see some more of this, you know? Yeah, yeah. Everything's right possible. Creator, good writers. And then, Jenny, to your point, some connection to what's come before, some. Right honoring or respecting the canon and its fans mm -hmm. right yeah. we're not just fans of anything you throw at us we're fans of a particular universe that's been shaped in a particular way right so then you think of okay when star trek went off the air and came back with jj's movie in 2009 uh, whatever opinions you might hold about the kelvin universe and how that all shook out right brilliant about that movie was the writers decided to find a piece of the canon right and, and wrap it around this mm -hmm. quote unquote reboot right which yeah. was getting leonard nimoy's participation mm -hmm. yeah connecting it with original spock and the prime timeline yeah he was the flag bearer so i could, I could see well, a new star and i could see that yeah i mean there's lots of points of contact, David, that's what we sat down in that day. Yeah. There's lots of points of contact that you can do with that. The quantum and mirror alone. Us, yeah. Right? Exactly. All you have to do is I mean, acknowledge it at the beginning in the first episode with this in some right. way. And that would satiate plenty of people just yeah. through that. Stargates can go to parallel universes. It's been established in canon. It, over and over and over again. I mean, look, all we have to do is go with Mobius and go from there and we're fine. But I think, and honestly, that's what, because uh, I've seen Roland Emmerich's script, is that how he was going to tie it to the TV universe was was that. 
because his was very ba- very much based on Daniel. Yeah. So the next movie was all Daniel centric and how he was going to tie it. And, you know, all credit goes to Rob Hochberg and Kieran for that, because they're the ones that convinced him at the time in 2017, 2018, if you're going to do this, you have to tie it. And so he was going to tie it back to Mobius. Okay, cool. Awesome. I think we all could have dealt with that. No problem. Would have been great. So there's obviously precedent in other shows. And then in addition to that, I think there's there's so much the fans will forgive if, David, like you said, it's done well. I mean, that's if I hear one more doom and gloom superhero comic book movies are over, no. Sh- oh, sorry, I was going to say bad words. Um, Shitty comic book movies are over. It's like, you know what, Warner Brothers, you failed because you had bad movies, not uh-huh. because we're tired of superheroes yeah. and comic books. There's too many people in that audience that love it. We'll go see a good one. Not, I mean, obviously, Barbie and Oppenheimer are the perfect example of one end of the spectrum to the other, as well as. <laughs> I mean, I watched Roadhouse. It's good. It's not great, but it's good. It's a B popcorn movie. And Amazon Prime has exceeded all streaming views that it's ever had, even Reacher. So obviously it just, and the reason it works, it's not great, but it's written for the audience that it's meant to be for, which is just a B popcorn movie audience. It's not trying to be something it's not. It's lots of, Mm. lots of fighting. Jake Gyllenhaal with his shirt off, snappy, witty, couple of repartee comments, Mm -hmm. Jessica being amazing. And that's it. That's Mm -hmm. it. That is the entire movie. There is no great deep plot to it. It's just that. And you can enjoy it for what it is. If we can get someone who can find that sweet spot, and here's where the the three elements have to be part of it. It has to be family team. It has to be humor. And it has to have adventure. And if it doesn't have those three, and that it isn't going to work that for ring fans. Thing, so, <laughs> but if it doesn't have those three, yeah. Stargate fans That's true. aren't going to accept it. It's got to have that team family feeling. It's got to have the humor, and it's got to have the adventure. That I don't think I don't know that Stargate fans would even care if there was some overarching story, as long as that overarching story was we're going through the Stargate again. Like, you know, that's, that's our story and go from there. Yeah. Uh, Laura Smith, loving the conversation, really informative and help ones helpful. Someone please tell Jenny that her hair is awesome. Great hair. Jenny <laughs> looks great. Thumbs up. Smiley face. Thank you. We did. That's Thank where you. We started the show. <laughs> Thank you very much. I great looking dog. I have... Oh, thanks. Sorry for the, uh, not that he has any industry insight, but, uh, <laughs> He, apparently, David heard your voice, and that was <laughs> all right. there was no. to it. I'll see That's that all there was soon. to it. We yep. Dieter 72. Why, why is Dial the Gate being ignored by the Amazon executives talking to Stargate YouTube sites? I don't know anything oh, I about. I haven't communicated I with them. They haven't communicated with me. Um, Darren, have you heard from anyone? If there's anyone at MGM who's thinking about reaching out to, to content creators, uh, you can find me by email. Yeah. Uh, I haven't heard anything from anybody. Yeah. No, I and this, I know, the, and I'll YouTube's be I'll be honest. Why I'm for not. Everybody. I know why I'm not. I it, I will be clear because I do want to be super honest. The reason I'm not is because I'm still tied to Stargate Command. Yeah. And internally at MGM, that was considered a, just a massive bummer failure. And so as part of that old guard, I know that they're not going to come back to me, which is fine. Mm-hmm. I think what I'm what I, what's far, far, far more important is making sure that that the conversation we had with the companion, when mm-hmm. Brad said how important it is that all aspects of the Stargate community are supporting each other, that's just unbelievably crucial. And I think that that has to be an inherent part of what that conversation is. I think that what I would want Amazon to not do is cut off its nose to spite its face that just because gate world and dial the gate are supportive of and interviewing the previous guard writing Mm. creative uh groups Mm. that doesn't mean that you're not looking forward to or supportive of a new 
franchise with new showrunners. And if that's if that's what's holding them back, then I would say that's a massive miscalculation. You don't want to miss the boat with an entire group of fans who are dedicated and who will follow you guys, you know, <laughs> anywhere off a cliff. Right? I'm like, under the assumption you know? that it's just timing as we get closer to them having some material need of us. Then, Precisely. Yeah, that's like, the only thing I can think of. Marketing. So, you know, it's all about the marketing the and marketing announcement. The marketing has to right. sit at a table and, and circle its ducks. Is that a metaphor? Wagons. <laughs> <laughs> ducks work what? too. There's a lot of flapping ducks underwater. Get its, all, get its ducks in a circle. In a, in a row. And, uh, yeah, ducks uh, in a row, circle yeah, just, the wagons. Right, Jenny, all the, all the stuff that, that you did within MGM uh, mm. for so many years and are so good at, which is figuring out the communication strategy with fandom, with online content creators, et cetera. Well, yeah, and think about how long it took. And thank you for that. I appreciate it. But I, I think that there are there's so there's so much time that happens between the discussion. David and I started talking with Michael Brown and those guys in 2015. An announcement wasn't made till 2017. Yeah, that was so, a long two I, years, man. It was a long two years. And I think that a lot of that is what's going on here. Again, it comes back to the post strike, picking up the conversation where it left off for them. Um, and, you know, as a fan, I'm just going to be so supportive. I want to be there for whatever they do. Mm -hmm. And I'm, I am genuinely optimistic because so far, a lot of the creative people that are friends of mine that they've chosen to work on different shows are amazing creatives. So the people at Reacher that has friends of mine working, working on it, um, rings of power for whatever. I know everybody's got different feelings yeah. about it. But those are some diehard fans. So Amazon's doing it the right way for people who understand and know the content. And I would hope that they do the same for Stargate, that they pick somebody like Michael Wright who knows and loves the content. And then he would pick people that know and love the content. Mm -hmm. Jeremy Heiner, we saw the Stargate Timekeepers video game released earlier this year. Do you think that will have oh, yeah. any impact on the future of the franchise? More, uh, more IP, you know, content, man. Yeah. Just keep play the game because that's a license. That's a licensee. So it goes yeah. back to Amazon pays an enormous amount of attention to a lot of attention in its research and its consumer insights as to where their audiences are. And if you're playing the game and you're out there talking about it, then they're going to pay attention to it. And then it also shows that they're willing to license to mm. test the waters. And every time a new license comes out, every time, and they just announced, I forgot, Darren, something just last month that you, I, I forget what it was. It was a new license for something. Was it and the I NFTs? Thought, okay. Oh, yeah, it was the NFTs. Every I, time I that happens. I surprised to see that, yeah. Well, they've got some new people over there and it's a good, what they're, it's testing the waters, right? Yeah. And one of the things that the Consumer Insights Group has found is that the people who are more willing to buy the NFT and in, oops, sorry. We're still here. Sorry about that. That was my husband calling from Africa. Oh. Um, that. Tell him to wait. I did. I already <laughs> texted. I'm like, I'm like, dude, I'm on with, with David and Darren. Um, <laughs> that the audiences for catalogs that are older are more likely to do an NFT if it's for a franchise or content that they've already believed in. So the younger crowd is obviously, they don't care, they're gonna try anything, but yeah. for people that are older to get them into NFTs, into any kind of web three or film three- makes 3, a lot of sense. Go with content that yeah. they trust. Okay. So that to me was, a, I was so encouraged that they did that. It's a, it is, that is a big, foot in the the water for them to test it i'm looking at the the products news on gateworld to remind myself of all the the new licensees yeah darren blue right? bricks blue bricks blue yeah. bricks right lego compatible brick building sets they're based in in europe so they're going to be you're going to pay a pretty penny to get them shipped over here yeah but those are shipping right now We're, we've got a story upcoming on that uh, Master Replicas, we know, has its license uh, to do new ships and props. We're going to hear more about that very soon. Oh, I can't wait with Master Replicas. Um, I have they did, right. 
That's they a... did a limited edition of the Hammond for their collection. Yeah, that's right. Okay. They did yeah. 500 of them, and I think they're gone. Really? Uh, but they're going to print more Daedalus. We're going to hear more about what they're doing soon. Um, let's see. What else is on here? Hollywood Collectibles is one of these high-end prop replica houses that does uh, right specialty items like uh, Catherine's. Yeah, we items. had them on. Uh, those are those are selling now. Uh, and guys, I think 2024 might be the year of Stargate Funko Pops. <laughs> really? Yeah. I didn't see that. I think it oh, might happen. There was a, a an unofficial kind of a Funko fan site, not a site, a, a Twitter channel that at the beginning of the year said the their information says that Stargate Funko is coming. Um, and I have a Ooh, little bit more intel since then that uh, I haven't confirmed. They went up on a Italian retail site, which we reported <laughs> on on GateWorld. There are listings for, you know, everything starts with the movies. And Jenny, you can yes. explain to us why so many of these licensees start with the feature film. But it's going to be like a, a, a movie Jack and Daniel and like a Horace Guard or something like that. Maybe Raw. Well, that's that's because they would have a licensee agreement with Lionsgate, not MGM. So a lot of times they start with a movie that's an older movie because it's it wouldn't be in the public domain, but it's a much, much cheaper license, much cheaper than the series. Series licenses are expensive, even catalog ones. So wow. the the Stargate 1994 movie would be much, much cheaper. OK, OK, because I know like the the. NFT started with the movie as well. Yeah, and it just makes sense. It was the same reason we did Origins off the movie, because we couldn't afford at the time when we started Stargate Command, we couldn't jump right into Brad's canon. It was going to be a lot more expensive to pay for that, because by the end, you had quite a few people who were part of that. So it was Brad and Robert and Joe and Richard and Amanda. They all owned a part of it. So that was going to be a lot more expensive to develop something mm. off that universe. Whereas their deal with, means that they get a, a nickel off of a, a new tie-in spinoff. Depending upon how the, the, the deal, deal is structured. Done. Yeah. So in terms of licensing for this kind of thing, if they're using their likeness, they have to, they have to be paid. So yeah. if for instance, the NFTs were easy because they weren't anybody's particular likeness, they could just pay Lionsgate for the movie rights and they licensed for probably a year um, and they had super limited. I think it was like 800 and 200, right? So they didn't have very many of them. Well, that's, that's easy. You know, it launched in March. I think they're almost sold out. So there, it, that was pretty straight. That was pretty straightforward. And, you know, if, if the, um, if the officials aren't going to authorize some things, some fans just go ahead and create stuff on their own yeah. as well. I've got a number of pieces back here for season four. Um, this Destiny Countdown clock was created by William Murphy, um, oh, a friend of ours, and it's just absolutely amazing. It has a timer feature that I mean to to use. This box here down with the with the Stargate um, Earth symbol is created uh, by a friend of mine named Jay Francois, and there's a there's a oh, Stargate yeah. inside of that, and I'm going to be planning on using that. Um, and also, uh, Martin McLean <gasps> has outdone himself again. Oh, so gorgeous! With creating... What's in the box? What's in the box? <laughs> What's in the box, David? Oh my God! Beautiful. Yeah, so. he showed me his prototype of this. Yeah. Hold it up. This is the ring transport control. Yep. And of course, it's Martin, so it's fully functional. Oh as, my God, that's so cool. As much as it can be, considering our current tech. So. There you go. And oh my God, it's dead. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> I can't believe it. I'm going to have right? to charge it. We'll have to come back to it. Yeah. Martin also made my knack with a reactor. Oh, oh no. all right. Is it lighting up? I love it. it well, is lighting up. It's got Stargate a bright light mirror shine. back here on my door. I've got the Stargate mirror and then you probably can't see it, but I've got the start, the Stargate box back there. And then I've got a, 
uh, Horace Head somewhere in there. And then I've got uh, Simone Bailey painted a painting for me that's back there in the Stargate. Oh, cool. One of Simone's paintings. Lucky you. Oh, my gosh. She's so, so cool. So if, you know, if there's if there is an, an industry out there, the point is that uh, there will be fans who will be Doing happy it. to take it along. And I'm, I'm so embarrassed that I don't have this ready to go. Martin, well, don't be embarrassed. We still got to see how cool it was. Yeah. And the thing is that I think the proof there, you know, like Sonia and everybody that's being able to do some fan stuff, there was recently a cease and desist that was sent out at the end of last year yep. um, to buy Amazon yep. and MGM. But in general, it had it has not been that bad. They are they are not Disney level mm-hmm. insane. And I think what they're letting people do is if you know, if you're doing it as a fan, what I've heard from them, and again, this was all last December, but what I heard was they're not going to crack down. Now, if if it goes forward, then you're going to see a much, much tighter group of people because legal will suddenly be paying attention. But for right now, they're just, they're excited to see that fans are still watching it and doing things that are involved, yep. which is great. I love it. Um, I hate to say... My husband's having a bit of an emergency in Kenya, okay. and I need to go and help him with it. So, um, is there are there any other questions or anything Let that, that like you know? Real so I'm so sorry because I I usually love to spend a nice long time with you guys, but Hunda Tuam, can we expect you think an announcement at San Diego Comic Con if anything is possible? Oh, and I mean, anything's Anything possible. Anything's possible the, San Diego. The thing is, is that would be the I know last year I do know last year they were planning on it. But with the strike, it didn't happen. Right. And they were supposed to, oh, sorry. They were supposed to do it with uh, Amanda and Michael, I think. Okay. Uh, so, but that got then that got thrown out the window, not just because of the strike, but because tons and tons of people got laid off, including Rob Hochberg and others who would have been yeah. part of that. So, um, look, MGM loves San Diego Comic Con. It has made a lot of announcements there. We made our announcement there in 2017 and 2018. So it's perfectly possible that they'll do that. Again, I think it depends on the state of the industry by July. Um, Marketing would have to be, well, that would come out of PR now, not just marketing. So it would really depend on, do they think that's the biggest bang for their buck and who else is going? There's a little bit of a weird dance going on right now of, are you going? I don't know if I want to go. Are you going to announce? You know, and they're all circling each other and nobody's committing because they're all waiting for someone else to make the commitment to go to San Diego. So I think it'll depend on that as well, too. Well, if they can be the biggest voice there and the, and not have to cut through the white noise, then that's an amazing place to make an announcement. Okay. Where are you going to be for the eclipse, Jenny? So currently... We think we're going to go up to Mount Laguna, but we'll have to see. I don't know if that's going to be the best place to see it. How about you? I heard you're going. So my parents' house is is in southern Illinois, right in the path. So everyone who's listening, I invite all of you to come over. So I would love to go. um, I missed the last one uh, because I was in Phoenix, but I'm not missing this one. So um, no, me neither. Yeah. Darren, how about you? We're too far north. We're going to miss it here in Washington State. Uh, we had one oh, yeah. years ago that we went out and saw that was fun. Okay, so you did yeah. see. Okay. Yeah, I would have to get on an airplane and fly someplace. Okay. <laughs> Where supposedly we can see it in San Diego for like a split, like I think it's 10 minutes or something like that at yeah. most. A chunk but of we'll it. We'll see. Yeah. We'll see. It's a good excuse to go to Mount Laguna. <laughs> there you go. Absolutely. Let me try this one more time, Jenny. Ring transport device, Orton P3X246, is now activated. Oh, that's so cool. That is so cool. It makes me so happy. I would just sit there and play with that all day. Oh, my God, that's so cool. (laughs) You got to tell him just... How absolutely beautiful that is. And check this out. David Reed mode is now activated. (laughs) So I can sit this on my shelf and it will blinky. 
I love that it's David Reed found that. Yeah, awesome. he created that specifically for me. So oh, the guy so is just awesome. a sick genius, mad scientist. I mean, seriously, that is so cool. I love it. That yeah. is so cool. Well, hey, please tell uh, Tim uh, uh, that we say hello. Give him our best. Yep. I will for sure. I will for sure. Um, everybody, I love to see everybody. Love to talk to everybody. Um, as always, I am on Twitter and Instagram at JS Steven or Jenny Steven. I'm on TikTok at Geek with Gray Hair. And I'm on LinkedIn at Jenny Steven. And I can't wait to see everybody. I will be at San Diego Comic Con with my new client. Um, she's at sgblaze.com. So Blaze. love you guys. Love you. Go Stargate. See you yep, soon. Love you. It's as always a blast to talk with everybody. Bye. Absolutely. All right, man. Um, this has been. Um, let me let me reconfigure this real quick here. I apologize, yeah, everybody. This is how this is how the sausage is made. Okay. Um, one second. How do What's I go going on in chat right now? Uh, what is going on in chat? Let's check in with everybody That's real quick it. before we go. Okay. How do I turn my video back on? I don't know how do I do that. How do I share my? Okay. Anyway, we're just gonna have to do it this way. Um, but it's just gonna be me now. Well, I Welcome mean, it's... everyone to my new show, Dial the Gate. <laughs> no, it's gonna be I'm just gonna go back and forth. So, uh, yeah, we had uh, I think at a at our peak 132. So, oh, Jenny's gone, so now everyone's leaving. Well, I don't blame them. I would probably leave myself. So, But um, I really appreciate you coming on and uh, breaking in season four with me. Um, wouldn't wouldn't have wanted to have it any other way. So it, it means a lot to, that you yeah. took some time to come back on. So, My great pleasure. What can you reveal to us about the plans for, for season four? I know that you've posted some names <sighs> over on the website at Dalgate. Yes, I, I'm, I will. I, I do not wish to, to utter them into okay. the ether. I want to, to keep them nope. on dialthegate.com. So if you want to go and have a look, those are everyone who have uh, indeed confirmed. Um, but there's... It's going to be a shorter season, I think. I'm not going to have as many. I hope to have a few more high-profile ones, um, especially with the Stargate feature film being the 30th anniversary. Does Gate World, do you have any plans for the 30th anniversary? Is there anything that you want to accomplish? I got a, you know, with Stargate anniversaries, it's any year that ends with a four or a nine. Yeah. It has a whole bunch of anniversaries. So this is a big year for Stargate. Uh, I haven't figured out what we're going to do yet. In October, it's going to be Stargate's 30th. It's yes. going to be Gate World's 25th. Uh, mm -hmm. July is uh, the 20th anniversary of Atlantis. Wow. That's so that's right. kind of what I'm. my focus is on right now is figuring out what to do for Atlantis's 20th. Okay. Yeah, that's going to be a big deal. So I might have to try and pursue Flanagan to get back on. I've I've asked him a few times since he's, he's done the initial... Uh, uh, appearance with us and I haven't heard back but I mean we may have to yeah. take some, some drastic did you, actions did you so. see the Guinness ad oh it was hilarious <laughs> absolutely hilarious so if you and Joe fulfilled a lifelong dream yes of doing Guinness commercial which I I, I want to say Joe like mentioned to us like 15 plus years ago that one of his dreams as an actor would be you know, pie in the sky to do a Guinness commercial. So can someone please go to YouTube and grab the full length Jason Momoa, Joe Flanagan um, Guinness commercial and throw it in the chat for me, please here, because I'll get a I'll, I'll get a copyright strike if I um, if I play it. So because <laughs> people one. are like, what is I'm sure there are people who are like, what are they talking about? So it's they, worth what? It was wasn't, wasn't it a Super Bowl ad? I don't remember seeing it during the Super Bowl. Okay, I didn't it's watch the Super Bowl. Online here in the last so it was Thursday. Super Bowl worthy. Let's just it was put it that way. Um, There's like a the online version is is like two plus minutes. It's like a short film. Yeah, it is, and it's it's a little action. It's a little action film, so it's solid stuff. I'm trying to think. I've I'm just really looking forward to the season. There's there's a number of folks that that we've wanted to talk with. Who um, thank you, Jeremy, uh, and Summer. Uh, who um, I, I think are probably going to be sucked into our orbit this time around. So there's 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 some good stuff. What, did you enjoy Michael Shanks's interview? I loved Michael Shanks's interview. That was that was a ton of fun. He was great, 
and I can't wait to have him back this season. We'll definitely have him back. He had a good time. Yeah. Um, well, so many of these actors are, I mean, you know, you see them on set, you see them on the TV screen, you know how good they are at that job. But then you go to a convention and you put them on stage yep. and that's yep. a whole different side of them. That's a, a, a different set of, of muscles that they work interacting with fans and they're, I mean, Michael's been doing it so long through conventions and interviews and such that he's just so good at it and he just knows how to turn it on and, and be entertaining. There are some people who they just, in terms of what we do here, um, we, we discover pretty quickly who is, uh, ha, their, their brain stores more information, it seems, than others. Martin Wood and Michael Shanks. You know, you you spit anything at them, and they can just—it's like winding them up and letting them go. You know, it's the most—it's the most wild thing to watch. You you can give them any bit of information, and they've all got—they've got it right there. I was telling him, asking him, like, who was this person? And he said, "Oh, it was such and such. Yeah, we did this and this." And I'm like, "That was that was tw that was 20 years ago. How do you know well, that?" You've been doing this for so many years and and have talked to most of these folks multiple times at this point. Yeah, that's true. I love I love it when a in an interview you can just say, Tell us the blank story. Mm hmm And they know immediately what you're talking about. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. And, and right, because you've set now set up Dial the Gate as an oral history project, as sort of a permanent archive of of the history of Stargate production that I love seeing that come up because I heard a two minute version of that story on stage at GateCon one year, but now we've got, you know, the full five minute version of it permanently archived on YouTube for us. Yep. What do you have behind you there? I see a play button. What is that? I, I do. Gate World passed 100,000 subs last year. Congratulations. Uh, so thank you for that. Yeah. Thank you for that. Come Absolutely. check us out on YouTube at GateWorld. You're going to find a lot of Dial the Gate content there right now, honestly, because I've been uh, busy with real life stuff. I've been busy with real life work. But uh, as of this week, actually, after we're done here, I'm going to go back to edit my uh, David Nickel interview. So that's going to be coming next. Okay. Cool. We're going to show off some more Stargate ships uh, in an upcoming video. I've got a box that I have not unboxed yet to add to these guys here. Uh, we're going to add the Daedalus and the F-302 and Prometheus I have in a box. Wow. Okay. That's solid so that's stuff. Coming up. But we still do Dial the Gate clips every single week for uh, folks who can't turn up to the live show or uh, don't maybe have a chance to watch the whole two-hour interview with Rob Cooper or Michael Adamthwaite or whoever it is. Uh, we do little – we syndicate little Dial the Gate clips on Gate World. And um, it is and, my uh, in, intent. I'm way behind. Well, yeah, I mean, yeah, there's the, I, the, there was a lot of content last year, so I get it. If you're only mm -hmm. posting one a week, it's going to take a while. Um, but it is it is my hope to start doing more of those, uh, in, putting those individual stories into clips so that people don't have to mine the two hours of, of some episodes to, to pull that off. But I'm frankly waiting for um, the wave to come along with the next Stargate project, whenever that's going to be. And then I'll start putting a lot of those legacy clips out there. So, cause uh, that's, there's just, there's just tons and tons of stories that have been collected. Now I was talking with you guys, I guess a few months ago. And really, um, I think it, with the people who have come on with the people who have declined to come on or not responded i think i'm past the halfway mark in terms of my uh in terms of my plans for for this for this thing so it's uh it's it's gone well and uh i i can't thank you enough for helping me pull it off because what you you um <laughs> you got out and pushed you know you really did so well, you've done the work. You and your team have, have done all the, the hard labor. Yeah. And it's really been a gift to... It's been a gift to fandom. It's been a gift to the history of Stargate. I mean, look at the fact that when Ed Gross wanted to write a history of Stargate yeah. book, he came to, to you and he came to the, the archive of interviews on Gate World, which are by and large, I think probably more than 50% are also yours. 
Uh, so that's right. The sort of resource that you've produced for this franchise is really incredible. Well, and I appreciate I'm, that. I think that we should all be grateful for, for you and your team and what you pulled off here. Well, we've got a long way to go. There's, there's a lot more to say and a lot more to, to see. And Stargate's not over by a long shot. So it's, uh, nope. it's just been napping. Um, but with, with the number of folks who are, I, I continually encounter, publicly who are like yeah i've seen that it's like yeah there's 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 a uh, they've got a tiger by the tail if they just want to tug on it a little bit so it's uh they bring this thing back and there's going to be people who are like oh that's that's i used to watch that let's let's have a look at this one so i hope i mean i every time i talk with jenny i get a little more hopeful <laughs> uh, this, well, we're gonna get there eventually because boy it's been yeah. a rough year too for me kind of mentally and emotionally uh, cause I can only tread water for so long and yeah, we can find stuff to do. We can find people to talk to and, and feature articles to write, you know, about episodes that aired 20 years ago. There's always stuff to do, but we need, we need the, the revitalization of, of new content, new fans, uh, and all that stuff. It's man, you think about the, the amount of time that passed when Star Trek went off the air, when enterprise went off the air was not very long before Star Trek got going again in right. some form. But then you look at something like, okay, BSG yeah. was off the air for 24 years, 23 years. Um, and that required a total reboot, right? Even though there were still some fans, right? There was a hardcore fan base who who loved the show, who were sort of, you know, cheering on Richard Hatch's revival efforts. Um after 20 plus years, it, it had to come back around and, and get rebooted. So that's we're now in between those two things mm -hmm. for Stargate. Or Twin and Peaks. I, or Twin Peaks, yeah. Which I watched just, last year and inhaled. The the dark side of my heart uh, just worries that MGM is, is just going to wait us all out, mm. right? Just through attrition, give us a, a reboot just because it's been, by the time they get around to it, 20 years. But talking to Jenny makes me hopeful. Is GateWorld healthy in terms of ad revenue, in terms of, of keeping the doors open? Do you have concerns yeah, or is it ticking right along just, just quietly waiting? That's not an issue for you. Relatively speaking, it's healthy. Uh, I can keep the lights on. The, the question is just how much of my time can I devote to it? And it's it's more or less a one-man show right now, right? Uh, Adam does some some content. He's spooling things back up. He's got some some video ideas and some okay. some articles that he wants to write. Uh, and then we've got some guest contributors that are working on stuff right now, both on the video side and on the written side. But running the site day to day is just me. So mm -hmm. when I start to to flag and and lose interest or get really busy with my day job, uh, it's just it goes on the shelf. Yeah. So healthy is a relative thing. The lights are staying on, but. Is it going to make it to year 26? Ask me in six months. Seriously? Like you, you, you'd, you'd be willing to shut it down? Ask me in six months. Okay. Okay. I was just always assumed that this thing was going to be around forever. You can't let it go, man. We get, <laughs> we need, we need, we need this so thing out I, there. Yeah. But you know, I'm, I'm an old man, and there's there's no Stargate. I do not like the sound of this. If I have to <laughs> fly up there and, and slap you, I will. Well, so. like I said, this is why talking with you and Jenny makes me feel better. Because uh, not only do we have a fantastic community of Stargate fans, but uh, uh, it, it rejuvenates me. It makes me want to keep doing it. And there are days right now where I'm just ready to wash my hands of it. SG One ar Archive cannot outlast you. <laughs> SG One Archive. That is all I'm saying. Oh, uh, remember our old competitor? I'm sorry, I don't. It's okay. It's okay. There's been a few kids since then. Um, Lou Gossett Jr. Yeah, Lou Gossett Jr. passed away last week. Uh, very I, sad. Uh, I um. I, I so wanted to interview him. Um, we, we tried a couple of times, but uh, it's just... Uh, ha have you seen um, Enemy Mine? 
Yeah, right. Years ago, so I'm an '80s kid. So that was that was a movie that I grew up on, Oh, okay. along with you know Tron and uh, Iron Eagle. We used to rent Iron Eagle all the time. Not that Louis Gossett Jr. was in Tron, but I'm just thinking of '80s sci-fi. And then my mind goes to Iron Eagle, which he did. Um, and it's yeah, he's been a part of my my film and TV enjoyment for my whole life. Uh, he had such a fantastic career. My first thought when an actor like that passes is what an incredible legacy, what a gift this person gave to all of us Man. through all these characters and all these performances. Man. And on Stargate, he played Garrett in season nine. Uh, and then my second or third thought down, down the road a few hours is that's someone we're not going to get to talk to about right. his Stargate experience. That's somebody we're not going to get on dial the gate. Yeah. Yeah, I've been I've been leaning my focus towards some of these uh, uh, older older folks to hope to to get them on. I want to sit down with Tom and and preserve some of his uh, memories and commentary form for the episodes. I want to fly up to Vancouver and sit down with him and get those recorded because exactly. you know if we we you know th these folks are old and you know many of them and they don't last forever. So I still think. Because I, I remember when the announcement was made about Lou Gossett Jr. and Bo Bridges. They, they came out about the same time in terms of announcements for Stargate. And I yeah. still think, as much There's as I game. loved Bo, yes, I, I, I also think that Lou Gossett Jr. would have been a kick-ass General Landry. I think he so would have been we, awesome. This is what we were told for folks who don't know, behind the scenes. Uh, in between seasons, season eight and season nine, the Stargate office ended up in contact, right? Casting ended up in contact with uh, reps for Bo Bridges and Louis Gossett Jr., who are both right stellar actors you'd love to have on your show. And they were both available to Stargate. And I think the way that I remember the story being told was the 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 Stargate producers kind of had their pick of the litter to decide who are we going to cast as our new general? And who are we going to cast as this really important uh, character in the new Free Jaffa story? And obviously they, they went with Bo for... General Landry, and they went with Lou for Garrick. It mm -hmm. could have gone the other way. Mm -hmm. And I think every day since since Lou passed, I think every day about what it might have been like if we had him as our General Landry for two seasons. There, there is a uh, a warmth and a uh, I don't I don't really know how I want to put. In terms of Bo, you know, he's kind of like I'll keep the light on for you. You know, in, in terms of that, I think I think with uh, Lou Gossett, had he played Landry, I think that there would have been that tenderness as well. But I think that he could have reached some some depths of, you know, if my team are in trouble, you're going to have a real problem on your hands. I I think that had that gone the other way, we, we would have gotten a a hard edged when appropriate and, and soft spoken also. Um Really amazing, amazing care, and it it was a testament to the show that they had. I think in both of these cases, I think they had family members who were fans. You know, at this point, the show was doing so well that you had people, and the same thing was with Mel Harris. Her son Byron was a fan. They were coming on to do the show for their families in so many of these cases, and it's a testament to the quality of the work that they were putting out. Yeah, yeah. Are are there other folks? I mean, you and I have brainstormed offline about who we would love to see on Dial the Gate. Uh, and I know that you have a long list and you can't necessarily tell me who's who's said no and who hasn't responded. But I think of folks who uh, we need would love to get their stories on the record as long as they're with us. Right. Um, so I think of some of the, the older cast and crew. Like, who played uh, Merlin? Who played Merlin? Matthew Walker? Thank you. Thank you. Uh, he passed. Um, oh, he did. But I didn't hear that one. Yes, yes. He he pa he passed on an. But I I may have. Oh, he passed on an interview. No, he didn't die. No, no, no. I'm, oh God, I'm sorry. No, he passed on the interview. So um, Matthew I, Walker has passed. No, no, no. He passed. On, God. Okay. Yeah, that does sound awful. Okay. He passed on the interview. Okay. Um, but I do want I do want to try again. Uh, Ronnie gave us a wonderful interview on Gate World. Um, Ronnie Cox, I, I really want to get him on Dial the Gate again. In terms of some of the others, the that one I, that I Google every other week to make sure he's still with us. Right, exactly, 
Exactly. How it's just a matter Ronnie? of time. How Ronnie old is Ronnie now? In his 90s. Well into his 90s. And then I also 85. think about... Oh, he's only 85. Yeah, he's only 85. Ah, it's spring chicken. There you go. <laughs> right, exactly. And you were about... Who? Who were you about to say? Uh, John Smith. In John Smith. Uh, I would um, on Dalvigate. I would love to sit down with him and his wife, who is the location coordinator. Uh, I have no direct line to them and few people do in terms of my connections um i would love to get him on so right now i'm i am trying to get vanessa angel on okay um so th there's there's one there uh i'm gonna keep my mouth shut on some of these others because some are in are in active uh, did you not play think of vanessa already i've never talked with vanessa angel Say I've seen her somewhere recently. Yeah, she's uh, in production of a pilot right now, so she'll have something to talk about. Brian Smith, I'm hoping to, Brian J. Smith, I'm hoping to get back his his film "A House Is Not a Disco" is currently in the uh, um, movie screening circuit, uh, the um, movie conventions, whatever those are called, South by Southwest, and mm -hmm. um, so his. I, I definitely want to talk with him about that. There's definitely some that we need to. Uh, get on the record before we Robert Davi I'm still thrilled that we got I, I'm kind of tickled that we got him he's up there as well so um, and you finished your your sort of whole cycle through every season with Joe Malazzi what about yeah. other other writers so Tor Valenza like we're, we're waiting on part two with him um, I also do want to bring back Heather Ash for an, for part two because for both of them we have we have uh, unfinished conversations um, there, there are stuff, there are definitely a few, a few more in play. I would love to get directors like, you know, like Ken Girardi, um, and, and a few other, but they're just so busy. The production, the production folks, you know, they're, they're in constant, um, they're constantly busy. Yeah, I'd love to get the Davidson brothers out too. What now? They're just hopping from one show to another. That's right. That's right. They've always got something going on and good for them. So uh, just, the, which brothers did you say? The Davidson brothers. The Davidson brothers. The Davidson brothers. So Mark Davidson was um, was set decorator on the show, and then his brother Robert, um, I think, did the same thing. I think he helped him as well. So yeah, they were both set decorators, and they worked um, through the entire run of um, of both uh, both all three shows. So I don't know about Robert though. I don't know about him for Stargate Universe, but definitely Mark went all the way through for for SG one. So there's a lot of folks to talk to. I also do want to go up and sit down with, Oh gosh, you just released the, the interview with her where she shows the, um, oh, yeah, Ivana, Ivana Vasek. I'd love to sit down with as many of the production people as we can and, and go through that book, go through that production book for, she has one for Atlanta season uh, for SG one seasons one through five. I know that that one exists. There may be others that uh, exist as well. And I want to just go down, go up there. I'm going to fly up there and I've, I've, I've bought a rig specifically for the purpose where we can film the book and us going through it um, page by page. Oh, wow. So, Wow, that'll be cool. Yeah, we just posted the clip of that and uh, where she shows off was that I think seasons one through five of seasons SG1. one through five. Lots of concept art and the comments on that video so far have been uh, you mentioned something in the conversation about wanting to come up and, you know, scan it, make a PDF of this thing for posterity. So uh, I don't of, know about that, but definitely, definitely. Um, yeah, not 4K that, high resolution you know, and, and, and discussion uh, as we go like a slideshow. But yeah, getting getting that material uh, archived somewhere in addition to the binder that sits on her shelf. Exactly right. Be amazing. Yep. So I'd love to get Mario as a party back for uh, another conversation. I'm I'm still pinching myself that we sat down with him. That was a thorough interview. Out. You what now? I I just prepped that clip for Gate World. That'll be in another week or two. Did you watch the episode? The full interview with Mario? No, I didn't. You need to watch that. That one's good. So, that one's yeah. Yeah, he's he is brilliant and insightful. His his brain is is uh, uh, 
quite something to behold once you get it talking to you. So, <laughs> but yeah, there's there's a lot. Very entertained that you were reminding him that you knew so much. But he was also reminding he himself the more that we talked. So there's it's in there. You just have to you just have to you know tap the right the right spots, and then it just all comes pouring out. So yeah, I love it when you find somebody who has kind of not been in Stargate circles since they did the work on the show. And uh, and you just blow them away mm-hmm. with your, your knowledge of not just the show, what was on screen, but your knowledge of the behind the scenes production, like the scratch on the film from shooting on Chulak. That was from a, a special feature for the uh, uh, Children of the Gods DVD that mentioned that. I had never heard that before. There's, there's certain details that just stick with you. And, the, you know, you get it. The more that you have conversations with some people. The more things come back. So, but yeah, um, hopefully a lot more Stargate feature film content this year as this is the 30th anniversary. Pie in the Sky, I'd love to get Kurt Russell. I'd love to. I don't think uh, Bat Maul the Gator brought this up. So, yeah, I don't think James Spader would be interested because, like you like you said, he did it for the paycheck. Um, Well, I wonder who else from from the movie, right? Obviously, you've talked plenty with Alexis. And yeah, with I'd like of art. Millie like, Avatar. I'd love to sit down and talk with her. Um, yeah. I I do want to sit down and and talk with uh, the first Catherine Langford, who was uh, what's her name? Vivica Linvers. No, she's been she's long gone. The little girl. Oh, the girl. Yeah. Uh, who played her? It's uh, it's. Oh yeah. It's, she was in Origins. Uh huh. Had that cameo at the end of Origins. Yeah, and her name is, and that's the girl from Thirteen Reasons Why, <laughs> who's also named Catherine Langford, uh, Kelly Vint Castro. So, my friend Ryan Nixon uh, uh, got her on his show, and I'd love to have her back. So, uh, that'd be cool. There's Patrick Tatopoulos. Uh, Batmall said that's that's correct. I'd I'd love to. Marsha Middleton's at French Stewart. Yeah, Batmall. Thank you, Kelly Vent. Yeah, so French Stewart. How about uh, Richard Kind? Uh, Richard said no. So I I asked him a few a uh, few years ago and they passed. So okay. yeah, yeah, French Stewart is would be fascinating, of course, because not just he has the 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 grounding in the feature film as the original Ferretti, but he came back to the franchise and played another character. Much correct. Later. And I'd love to talk to them about Third Rock from the Sun. So, yeah, it's all good stuff here. Yeah, but the, 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 all all this is to say that um, that miles to go before I sleep, if I may borrow from one of my favorite poems. So good. Yeah. Anything else to uh, add to reports? Anything else to say or do before we? Uh, yeah, Jay Davidson. We'll we'll see Summer. Um, but uh, yeah, he and Marsha. But yeah, he's not. Um, he, he's hard to reach. So N- not all these people have contact info because not all of them are in the industry anymore. So, yeah. Right. And those that you can reach um, a lot of folks, uh, unless they're talk, unless they have a new project that they can talk to mm-hmm. you about and they're, they're less likely to, to grant interviews, right. If they're a working actor who's, you know, busy six days a week, then they can slide you in as part of PR for right. their next project. Right. But they can't necessarily, right? If they don't have something that they're currently promoting, then they might just be too busy. That's how we got Armin Shimmerman. And he is open to coming back on. Uh, just just a wonderful human being. And if I can get him back, I'd like you to be there with me for that one. Because uh, That'd be stellar. he's still promoting his, uh, his Illyria uh, series based on the Shakespeare books. And, I mean, we all love him as Quark. But, I mean, that was he was one of the big reasons that the Knox remained such a staple for so long. So, yeah. Yeah. Have you talked to the other Knox? Uh, so his his buddy, um, who, who, Ray who, Zifo. Ray Zifo. Yeah. Zifo. I would love to get Ray on. Um, and I think with you Armin's help, I should be able Frida to pull that off. After- I have been inviting Frida for a long time and my emails have gone unanswered. So okay. we'll see. Man, all, <laughs> all my bag of tricks are being exposed. Um, there's was, some... I met her finally at, at GayCon yes. in, in 2018, but she wasn't there year before last. Right, exactly. No, yeah, she was there for, for 2018. I remember I remember going up to her and saying, you know, your, your character was so important to me. And she was like, really? And I'm like... Yes, <laughs> of course. <laughs> You're sitting here, aren't you? Yeah, you you must you must mean something to some of, to some of these people. And there's just some actors who are just they there's they're still always surprised uh, that their work resonates, and it's it's true. 
So, yeah. All right, man. Oh, um, and uh, I want a huge thank you to um, Matt Wilson, Eagle SG. I don't know if you saw, but uh, a certain spaceship was present at the opening of this episode. So Eagle SG, Matt Wilson, he's done some amazing work. His information is in uh, the credits. And uh, we've got a few more ships to show you this season, per depending on which guests come, uh, come on. So keep an eye for some eye candy, some spaceship eye candy. So. Shall knock. <laughs> Direct translation. Very cool. Buddy, I appreciate you. Uh, yep. You are always in my thoughts, uh, even though we don't talk very often, get to talk very often anymore. So, but um, yeah, so I, I appreciate you coming on. Well, let's do it again. Sounds good, man. Thanks. Be well. It was Darren Sumner of Gate World. Also, we had Jenny Stiven. Uh, Clio Consulting, industry marketing veteran. Thank you so much for tuning in. Uh, it uh, means a lot that you all are joining me for for season four. Before we go, if you enjoy Stargate and you want to see more content like this on YouTube, it would mean a great deal if you hit that like button. It makes a difference with uh, the show and will continue to help us grow our audience. Please also consider sharing this video with a Stargate friend. And if you want to get notified about future episodes, click the subscribe icon. And giving the bell icon a click will notify you the moment a new video drops and you'll get my notifications of any last minute guest changes. And clips from this live stream uh, will be released over the course of the next few weeks on the Dial the Gate and possibly Gate World uh, channels. So we'll decide uh, at that point whether uh, Darren wants to take a piece from this, uh, from this show or not. I think that's all that we've got for you here. There's all kinds of... Of, of things in development here that, that are uh, that are happening um, at least on this end for for Stargate uh, in terms of dial the gate I really appreciate Anthony and Jeremy for doing our moderating for this episode big thanks to that team and everyone who are involved in in uh, in continuing to help us uh, uh, stay afloat here tremendous uh, thanks must go out to um, my moderators, uh, my other moderators as well, Summer, Tracy, um, you guys make the show uh, possible. And big thanks to Frederick Marku at Concepts Web. He's our web developer on uh, dialthegate.com. So appreciate you guys all making this happen. My name is David Reed, and I'll see you on the other side. All right. Good stuff, sir. Yo, yo. And yeah, any. Yes, absolutely. You're seriously thinking about shutting it off. Well, why not just let it exist? Why does it have to, you know, that's my, that was my scare. That was my scare. It's like, why do that? You know, so. Okay, because go through and read the chats again because you you shocked a few people. <laughs> well, it was you shocked me. I wasn't expecting you to do that. Yeah.